Pardon? Started here. Well, okay, looks like okay. Sorry about that. Um, so, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, so, we're going to be continuing on um, from where we left off last time. We discussed post critique. Um, we're going to be uh, discussing a set of approaches that are very kind of closely related to post critique and are also kind of subject to a lot of the same kinds of criticisms. Um, in particular, we're going to be discussing uh, today scientific, quantitative, and computational approaches uh, to literary criticism. So we're going to be looking at two essays that were published in 2014, uh, Patrick Colm Hogan's uh, Literary Brains, Neuroscience, Criticism, and Theory, and Ted Underwood's Digital Humanities, Theorizing Research Practices. Um, and a slightly older essay from 2001 by Franco Moretti called Planet Hollywood um, that really kind of um, encapsulates uh, the way we can use quantitative data and uh, machine learning to aggregate large amounts of data that can help us identify broad trends um, <clears throat> in literature and culture. But uh, I think it's worth acknowledging that for a long time, science and the human the sciences and the humanities were not really considered a kind of natural fit um, <clears throat> with each other. So um, in 1959, a British novelist, chemist, and civil servant by the name of C.P. Snow uh, delivered a lecture at Cambridge uh, that he called the two cultures, at least half of it was called, the first half of it was called the two cultures. And the two cultures he was talking about were um, the culture of scientists, the culture of the sciences, and the culture of humanists, um, literary critics, uh, authors, historians, linguists, so on and so forth. And the thrust of Snow's lecture was really to kind of go after the British educational system, uh, especially the educational system that most cultural elites went through, uh, for overemphasizing the humanities at the expense of the sciences. Um, and he argued for bridging the gap between scientists and humanists by balancing those curricula. So this is a quote. Uh, a key quote from the uh, the two cultures that kind of really encapsulates what Snow's argument was about. Um, so he, he writes here, a good many times I have been present at gatherings of people who, by the standards of the traditional culture, are thought highly educated and, would have, and who have, with considerable gusto, been expressing their incredulity at the illiteracy of scientists. Once or twice I have been provoked and have asked the company how many of them could describe the second law of thermodynamics. The response was cold. It was also negative. Yet I was asking something which is the scientific equivalent of, have you read a work of Shakespeare? I now believe that if I had asked an even simpler question, such as, what do you mean by mass or acceleration, which is the scientific equivalent of saying, can you read? Not more than one in ten of the highly educated would have felt that I was speaking the same language. So the great edifice of modern physics goes up, and the majority of the cleverest people in the Western world have about as much insight into it as their Neolithic ancestors would have had. So essentially, kind of like what Snow is playing on is um, the definition of and the way we think about illiteracy, that these people who are highly literate in the conventional sense, um, are scientific, scientific illiterates and not particularly bothered by that, right? They, they don't understand that the fact that they don't understand much about science doesn't bother them, but the fact that scientists don't understand very much about their fields of knowledge, um, at least that they, as they perceive it, um, does bother them a great deal. So what Snow is actually arguing for here is um, a kind of mutual understanding, right? You know, that scientific, one, you know, the idea that scientific literacy should be as valuable as the ability to read and the ability to read dense and complex texts. Um, 
and also that scientists and humanists both have a good deal to learn from each other um, if they can agree on some you know common language so this set of methods that starts emerging kind of in the early aughts um, I think is um, an attempt to bridge that gap between the sciences and the humanities. So when we talk about these scientific, digital, and quantitative methods, um, yeah, we're talking about ideas that like, we're talking about kind of two sets of human experience, right? The sciences and the humanities that both require interpretive skills in dealing with data. Um, for example, evolutionary biology requires knowledge of life science and also of historical processes. Um, geneticists are increasingly interested in the relationship between human cultures and biological inheritance, right? The extent to which um, our environment and our cultural um, upbringing affects um, <clears throat> the genes we pass along to our descendants. Um, and they're also trying to take advantage of the fact that computers can read very large bodies of texts much more quickly than a human being can, and can also produce statistical models and maps um, that can show you unexpected relationships between things. So we're going to start by talking a little bit about neuroscience and biology. So Patrick Colm Hogan is an American literary critic. He is uh, based at the University of Connecticut. And he is a pioneer in the field of what he calls neurohumanities. And essentially what this is, is the application of neuroscience research to literary analysis. So let's talk a little bit about how this operates. Uh, so one of the things Hogan talks about is what he calls situated cognition, right? That is the study of how the brain processes ongoing environmental interactions over time. So this is something that he sees as particularly useful um, to examinations of how and why people read. So cognition from a neurobiologist's perspective is one, it's embedded. It occurs in a specific, then this means it occurs in a specific context. Two, it's embodied. You might remember our, dis our discussion uh, last time about the embodied mind, right? So it's physically located in a particular body. And it's distributed. What this means is that it includes interaction with other embedded embodied consciousnesses, right? So these three kinds of cognition, these three definitions of cognition are all occurring in a specific environment um, over a particular period of time. This is situated cognition. And certain common cognitive structures like our, the way we form family attachments, um, according to Hogan, can explain why we respond in particular ways to texts, right? The, you know, the, the, the cognitive structures in our minds encourage us to interpret text in particular ways. Um, and he's also, he's heavily influenced by the reception theorists of the mid 20th century, people like um, um, Hans Robert Jaus and uh, <clears throat> Hans Georg Gadamer. Um, and he believes that neuroscience research can help confirm and explain the findings of reception theorists, right? So reception theorists make the argument. Neuroscientists can then show us whether or not those arguments hold up. So this is another thing I think to remember about a lot of these more scientific approaches to literature is that they're often less about interpreting specific texts and often more about, like reception and reader response theory, um, figuring out why people 
respond to text in the way they do. Now, Ted Underwood is, uh, I believe he teaches at the University of Chicago, but he is an American literary scholar and information scientist. And Underwood is a key figure in the development of what comes to be called the digital humanities. Um, and when we talk about the digital humanities, we're talking about basically a set of practices um, that involve using computers to read texts and trying to use the readings computers produce of texts um, <clears throat> to notice broad trends um, or uh, or over or patterns that we've overlooked um, through you know like past human readings. Basically, if you're using a computer to read texts, you are doing some version of digital humanities. Uh, this was an incredibly hot field of study about 10 years ago um, and has since come under a good deal of criticism for reasons we'll talk about in a little while. But um, one of the things that Underwood argues is that it's not enough to just have a, like run um, a text through a computer and see what comes out. Uh, he argues that humanists really need uh, to develop a theoretical or philosophical understanding of what they're doing when they use um, or write digital search algorithms. So he talks a lot about data mining. And what he means by this is using a programmed algorithm to search large quantities of text quickly to find patterns and similarities. He also talks a good deal about using com about computer science as a specific kind of philosophical discourse, not as kind of like just a merely instrumental um, means of you know, like getting computers to do things. Um, so data mining and large scale search, according to Underwood, are built on the assumption that common word is the kinds of common word associations you could use you can use a computer to pick up or you could use a computer to pick up in 2014 um, are in fact meaningful um, and and he talks a bit also about the distributional hypothesis which argues that the meaning of a word is related to its distribution across contexts and you can use a computer right to note the ways in which this meaning is built through distribution across contexts. Um, this is what he says is used by computer scientists to build their data mining algorithms. Um, and another thing here is computers are useful for, in addition to just kind of digging up um, you know, concord, you know, word concordances and things like that, like, you know, finding um, the occurrence of a specific word every time it appears in Shakespeare's catalog um, or, um, <clears throat> you know, um, finding words that are associated with each other in Christopher Marlowe's plays, things of that nature. Um, he talks about what he calls topic modeling. And topic modeling is using a computer to create a map of clusters of terms that occur in similar contexts. So you'll see if you turn to the Underwood article in your textbook, um, you'll see a couple of figures that give you examples of this. Um, and that you running the computer algorithm and producing the map does not in itself produce an interpretation, right? What it gives you is another set of data points that you can then try to interpret to make an argument about. And I think part of the argument that Underwood and others who are invested in the digital humanities are making is that we can use these kinds of readings um, not so much to close read specific texts, but um, to find broad connections, say, between all the texts written within a certain period, um, or to um, trace the development and history of certain literary tropes and genres um, over time. And that all owes a lot to the work of this man, Franco Moretti, uh, who is an Italian-American literary historian, 
um, who pioneered the concept of distant reading. So Moretti argues that we should abandon, at least on our first read of any text, the traditional practice of close reading, right? So close reading, you'll recall from our discussion of formalism and the new critics, is that practice of closely examining, minutely examining the linguistic or intertextual features of a single text, right? We're, you know, we're examining every word and the associations that that word conjures up, how it connects to other words within the text we're examining, um, and how those link it to other texts, right? So it's all based on very close attention to a single text. Moretti isn't really interested in reading single texts. What he's more interested in is stepping back for a kind of bird's eye view of a moment in literary or cultural history and looking for larger historic and geographical patterns. So exactly the kinds of things we were talking about that computers were good at locating, right? You know, broad historical trends, um, the popularity of particular genres at a particular time, um, the history of uh, the history or evolution of a particular character type, um, things of that nature. Um, he's heavily influenced by the Frankfurt School and their writings on the culture industry and how the culture industry um, kind of turns cultural artifacts into commodities for sale. So the essay that you read for today, Planet Hollywood, is specifically about kind of like the global popularity of Hollywood films, right? Which types are most popular? Where are they popular? Um, and what explains their popularity or lack thereof? in particular, regional contexts. So a couple of things Moretti notes, right, is that Hollywood films are less popular in regions like Scandinavia that have their own um, strong film industry traditions, um, Hong Kong as well. Um, they're also, um, also the comedies translate across borders less well than action films. Um, action films being primarily reliant on spectacle and simple narratives. These are things that translate fairly easily across cultures, whereas humor does not, right? Humor is often dependent on um, knowledge of specific cultural codes and on uh, lang uh, language and you know, the use of linguistic idioms in ways that other genres are not. So things that say, you know, like, you know, a Scottish person finds funny, um, someone in India might not, you know, might not, right? You know, like the, the, there's, you know, the, the difference in cultures and the linguistic differences um, mean that humor develops rather differently, right? So, Moretti's basic method is based on the fact that computers are able to process large data sets to notice broad trends and patterns much more quickly and efficiently than human beings can. Though human beings must still evaluate and interpret the data, right? So we used a computer and quantitative methods to come up with all of the, to come up with the, this, this data about where Hollywood films are popular and where they are not. But then um, he is, he, one still needs to apply human interpretive practices to make some kind of meaning out of that data, right? The computer's still not going to do that for you. And I think that that is one thing that people often misunderstand about um, digital humanities methods. Now, like post-critique, these uh, scientific and quantitative approaches do generate um, a good deal of friction within the academy. Um, a lot of traditionally trained humanists um, object in very serious ways to a lot of these methods. So I just want to let, you know, um, I want to give you a short list of the kinds of objections that these approaches tend to raise. Um, one 
is that because that is that these are the, the, these projects are often too closely aligned with business interests, especially in the technology industry, to maintain scholarly objectivity. Right by and large, the people doing digital humanities are not really designing their own tools. They're using tools that are publicly available that are designed by large technology companies, um, and what those companies do with data is uh, sometimes questioned by those who are critical of these approaches, um, whether um, the, the shortcomings of the technology itself um, lead to certain blind spots, um, particularly in terms of things like racial bias. Um, that is an issue that sometimes springs up. Um, and <clears throat> The fact that a, a, that a humanist uses these tools doesn't necessarily mean that they understand how they work or what's going, you know, like basically what's going on under the hood or what's, what's, what, what's happening to all the data that's being processed. And I think this is something that is going to become an even bigger issue um, with the advent of large language model artificial intelligence like chat gpt right the effects that all this is going to have on literary criticism um are as yet kind of unknown um but um i'm expecting that we will be having similar kinds of debates about this technology another objection people raise to this stuff is that it tends to require expensive equipment um, which reduces um, scholars' access to the digital humanities, you know, to basically to institutions that have a lot of money to throw around, um, and also funnels money away from other areas of humanities research. Um, we saw a lot of this happening in the 2010s. Um, I was uh, on the job market at the time early in the decade, and it was clear that this was the hot thing because every job ad that I saw was looking for somebody who did, um, I don't know, like say, um, pick, you know, pick a random period field, you know, like 18th century British literature and digital humanities or post-colonial literature and digital humanities, um, modern British literature and digital humanities. It was like to the point where like, it was clear that a lot of the people on the hiring committees maybe didn't even know what this was but they knew that this was the new big thing and they were trying to get it on the ground level. People have also questioned the pedagogical value um, of the digital humanities, right? Whether it produces anything that is itself teachable or is even useful to teachers. Um, again, remember, like basically what you're doing is feeding texts into a machine and having the machine then kind of produce statistical models for you. And it's the classroom application of that is open to question. And related to this is dis disagreement over whether quantitative methods produce cultural criticism or just data. Um, the digital humanities boom um, went into a kind of hibernation in the mid aughts, really actually not too long after Underwood's essay was published, um, in part because a lot of people did, just didn't deem the scholarship it was producing as all that interesting or insightful. Um, and I think, again, that a lot of, you know, I'm, I'm a little skeptical of some of these methods myself, but I do also think that a lot of, a lot of the people who are most critical of the digital humanities in particular, um, again, kind of aren't quite getting that part that you have to interpret the data the computer spits out, that it doesn't, you're not programming it to do the thinking for you. Um, but I can certainly see why a lot of people would regard this as, in some ways, a very expensive, um, it's a very expensive approach that doesn't always produce interesting results. 
um, or results that are insightful in the way of traditional humanities scholarship. Um, but you know, for a little while, um, this was the thing that a lot of professors and administrators in particular um, thought was going to really revive enrollments in the humanities. The more we can link up um, the humanities with people using technology and using computers, the thinking went, um, you know, the, the healthier humanities enrollments will be. And yet humanities enrollments continue to crater for a variety of reasons. Um, and, you know, I don't necessarily have the answers for that, but I also suspect that the kinds of answers computers tend, tend to give us are often not the kinds of answers that people are really looking for when they take a course in literature or philosophy or history. And I'm not just talking about, you know, scholars who are trained in traditional methods. I'm talking just even about your, you know, your average university student. Um, okay, so um, that is all I have for you on this for today. So I'll post this uh, to George of you, and then I will post discussion board questions as per usual tomorrow. Uh, so we'll see you on the boards, and I hope you got lots to say. Take care.